learning a language is kind of like a video game. I mean, kind of, not like not exactly the same, but let me explain. Si, yo so, uh, sono me mayo. I'm not a big gamer. I, you know, I've played my fair share of Super Smash Brothers, but that was like when I was a teenager. But lately I'm getting back into it. We got a Nintendo Switch. I've been playing it with my boys, Zelda, this cool game called Cardo that has to do with maps. Good times. Another thing I've been doing during quarantine is not traveling. <laughs> Last fall, when I started realizing that COVID wasn't going away, I would not be traveling anytime soon, I decided to get my travel buzz by learning a new language, Italian, the language that is spoken in my favorite region on earth, right up here. Four months ago, I didn't speak a word of Italian, and today, adesso posso parlare italiano. No perfettamente, ma capisco quasi tutto, e lo abilità di esprimermi in una conversazione. Voglio dirti come lo ha fatto. Andiamo. So, I've been driving back from work and speaking to myself in Italian. I am feeling my head. There's like a physical buzzing that happens. Serve le lasagna bolognese. For the past three months, I've been studying Italian in the morning and playing video games with my kids at night. I recently started to realize how some of the major lessons from video games can be applied to learning a new language and to do so in a much more efficient way than was taught to us in school. By the end of this video, I want to explain this concept of video games and language learning, and I want to give you my best takeaways on teaching yourself a new language. So back to video games. My favorite video games are ones with maps. Big surprise, he's a big map guy, he loves maps. I know, I'm like a walking cliche, I just like maps, okay? So, if learning the language is sort of like a video game, here's the map of the video game. This is the learning language journey. You start here, knowing nothing about your new language. And your goal is to beat the final boss, this elusive idea of fluency. In other words, when you start, you're Link, and you just woke up from a hundred year nap, and you have three hearts, and no weapons, and no stamina, and no skills, and no powers, and you don't speak the language. Where you wanna be is like this. Having lots of skills and tools to navigate a conversation with precision and skill and beat the game. In other words, to become fluent. fluent. But wait, 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 okay. This is a moment. This is a thing I need to distinguish, a distinction we need to make. What is fluency? What does that even mean? I'll turn the question on you gamers out there. What does it mean to beat a video game? One person will tell you that beating a video game means just beating the main storyline, beating the main boss, Ganon, Bowser, whatever. I can already feel some of you shaking your heads because there are lots of you out there that say, no, 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 beating a video game means beating everything, all of the challenges, all of the little things like beating the shrines and getting all the Korok seeds and all the other things that have nothing to do with the main storyline. You have to beat them all or you haven't beaten the game. Okay, so here's where the connection between language learning and the video game concept comes together. When you're learning a language in language school or most formal programs, the map looks like this. You start here knowing nothing and the journey to beat the game to become fluent, fluent. is a long, windy, path with lots of gates and trials and gatekeepers. they are soldiers who are standing guard, making sure that you beat them before you go on to the next step. You can't progress along this path until you've memorized how to conjugate the present imperative tense, including the irregular forms. So you study them. You study, study, study just to make it past this first gatekeeper. You don't even really know what present imperative means, but you look at the book, you memorize it, and you do what you need to do to show up and pass the test so that you can move on to the next thing that they're teaching you in the school formal environment. So then you move on and you get to the next gatekeeper and the trial, which is you can't move on until you've memorized the subjunctive conjugations. 
and you're like, what does subjunctive mean? And it's just like, I don't know, but you need to go memorize it. Oh, and memorize this random list of 20 words that we think are important. It's the only way to fluency. If you want to be fluent, you have to get through this gate. <sighs> okay, I'll memorize the subjunctive. You keep going on your journey, passing the gatekeepers, memorizing the concepts that are in the book that the teacher is telling you. And the idea here is that if you beat all of these gatekeepers and you memorize all these rules, you make it to the final level and you beat the final boss and then you are fluent. fluent. The problem is, this isn't a fun video game. It's actually a grueling process of memorizing abstract ideas. So people don't actually beat the video game very often. They usually give up around here and they say, F it. And they throw in the towel and they feel like language learning is just not for them. Meanwhile, some of us beat the game. Like I actually beat the game. In college, I got a minor in French. Like, a minor, like I studied French through all of the levels in college to get a minor. I beat this game and I finally beat the final boss. I got here to the end of the map and I had all the conjugations, the direct object pronouns, the past conditional and auxiliary verbs and all of it. And then I go to Paris and I go to order a baguette and I realize that I literally don't know how to order a baguette in Paris, even though I have a minor in French. There is nothing more disappointing than that. It's sad. Luckily, there's a happy ending to this video, this story that I'm telling you, but right now it's just sad to think about getting a minor in French and then not actually being able to speak it. Oh, I need a little bit of a change of pace. I'm gonna crack open a bottle of wine. Which begins the next segment, which is thanking today's sponsor who sent me a giant box full of literal wine. Look at this. Whoops. Check this out. This box arrived on my door two days ago. Inside of the box, there are some really cool things. So Bright Sellers, who sponsored today's video, sent me this box. They had me take a quiz before on things that I like, the type of food and the types of like personality traits I have, like all this, this whole like quiz. And then they used the information from that quiz to send me this box of wine. What I like about this is because when I go to buy wine at a store, I have no guidance. Like there's no guidance for me. I'm not super well versed in all of the different variables that make good wine. I'd like to be, but it's big and complicated. And for someone to automate that and to present it in a way that's fun and, and like sort of empowering with information, that's actually my favorite part about the whole thing is they will send me these cards for each bottle of wine that has a little infographic on it. I like infographics. That's like my thing is like there's maps and there is origins and there's a story about like where this came from. There's flavor notes if you're into the flavor notes game. For me, ritualistic things like cheese and wine and all of it is way more enjoyable if there's a like story associated with it. Bright Sellers is giving 50% off, which is half off for anyone who clicks the link in my description for your first six bottles. So you could sign up for this sweet thing, get six bottles for 50% off. And it's a really good deal. And again, the convenience, the information, the experience of this is, is really cool. I'm excited. I'm excited to explore this and have some knowledge and story associated with it. So thank you Bright Sellers for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to the story of learning Italian through a video game map. I beat the game. I got here and realized that this version of fluency was one where I had a deep understanding of French grammar. I even had an understanding of its history. I could read literature in French. I could write properly. I knew where all the accents went. I even had a decent pronunciation, but I couldn't speak the damn language when I traveled to France. Like, wasn't that the whole point? For all you Zelda people out here, let's just say I had gathered all the Korok seeds and beat all the shrines, but still hadn't beat a single divine beast. The thing that actually mattered to me, the thing I wanted to do. What if I decided that this isn't where I wanted to go at all? This version of fluency wasn't important. This isn't the game I wanna play. What if we decided to take a different approach? a different path, a much simpler goal. And what if that goal were as simple as, I want to be able to travel to a foreign country and be able to speak to the locals and have them understand me and be understood when they speak to me. Okay, what, like, what, is that revolutionary? Like, no mastery of grammar, no perfect pronunciation, no ability to read and write with any elegance, 
no literature or cultural history of the language, just the ability to use words to communicate and then to understand the response. Nothing else. No f***ing seeds. I can already hear the comments, but you're learning a language. You have to know the grammar or you won't be fluent. Or in other words, if you don't gather all the Korok seeds, you didn't beat the game. Listen, if my definition isn't fluency for you, I don't want your fluency. I don't need it. I just want to be able to go on a trip and speak to the locals and ask for directions and have a conversation with a taxi driver and order food. That is all I want. I'm being a little snarky here because the language learning community on the internet has some very strong opinions and expectations about what real language learning looks like. You may see them in the comments telling me that my Italian actually isn't valid because I don't understand the past conditional tense. Not sure how to respond to that, but I reject your objection. <laughs> so a few months ago, I set out to test this out to see what this destination looks like. Not this, but this. I learned a lot and ended up making an entire course about it with my friend Nathaniel Drew. But I want to summarize the major things I learned and share them with you. Quelle montagne sono bellissima, bellissime. Disorienting. Okay, before I dive in and give you exactly the things I learned in this process, let me do a few disclaimers that might be helpful to some of you who actually want to take away some value from this video. Number one is that this is my experience. It's my experience, it applies to me in my unique situation. It worked well, and it may work for you, and it may not work for you, but don't see this as like a plug and chug formula. That is not what this is. This is my perspective and my experience. Number two, I want it to be clear that I spoke literally zero Italian in like October of last year. I am fluent in Spanish, which is a romance language, which is like a cousin to Italian, and I did study French in college, as I've mentioned 57 times. So I had some advantage, but the reality is I knew zero Italian. I could say things like ciao and like that was it. Pero adesso parlo non molto bene, ma posso avere una conversazione con qualcuno. Posso parlare del passato, el futuro, posso exprimirme i miei sentimenti e idee astrate. Certo che fatto dei errori, pero non importa. Secondo me, se tu capisci, va bene. That's what matters. That's what I care about. I rejected this and I think there's a better way. But that doesn't mean it's easy. It means that it's just more direct. There are still trials. They're just the most efficient trials you need. And here they are. Number one, not all words are created equal. The first thing I did was to assess what are the most common and useful 1,000 words in a language and solely focus on those, completely blocking out all others. This isn't a new concept. Scholarly research shows that this is very useful, and I, history does too. I, last year, was reading a lot about American imperialism for obvious reasons, and I stumbled upon this wild story. After World War II, the British and Americans who had just won the war wanted to spread the English language throughout the whole world. So they adopted a stripped down version that they called basic. They were carefully selected words. They were the most frequently used and most useful 850 words in the language. By the way, English has like over 150,000 words. And this language created by a linguist of English was only 850 words. And they use this to go promulgate English around the world. They're like anyone in the world can learn English very quickly if they just have to learn these 850 words. The inventor of the language once said, quote, it takes 400 words of basic to run a battleship. And with 850 words, you can run the planet. He literally said that. Like, this is like an extreme version of what I am talking about here. Some words are more important than others. And if you just memorize those words, those words that you actually are gonna use, then you can like supercharge your language learning process. Now this is where my friend Nathaniel Drew comes into the story. Nathaniel is a guy who loves languages like I do. And he also believes in this more direct path. So he's challenged himself to learn as much of a new language as quickly as he possibly can, all on his own. By the way, much to the chagrin of 
language learning internet communities who love to say that people are learning languages the wrong way because it doesn't fit their model. In doing so, Nathaniel realized the same thing the British and American governments realized in like the 40s, that if you just prioritize the most vital words, the ones that you actually use, you can rapidly acquire a language if you block out all other words and only focus on the most important. Nathaniel had made a list of what he deemed to be some of the most important words for his life and for just everyday communication. He gave me that list and I added to it. I did a bunch of research on the data of most frequently used words and I put it together into a list of a thousand words that I think are the startup kit, the most important words you need to memorize, the ingredients, the building blocks of a language. This is the first step. Before you do anything else, memorize the most important words of a language. How do you memorize all these words? I'm not gonna go into it right now. I have this box that I use that has all my words and it, I, in the course that we made, I go into exactly how this thing works. It's based on all the psychology that forces these words into your long-term memory. The point is memorize the most vital frequently used words first and your life will be a lot easier in learning this language. I saw this, okay, like just recently. Like I went from knowing zero words in Italian to within the first week knowing 200 words of Italian. You can't speak super well with just 200 words and, and no grammar, but you can certainly start to express yourself. Quel, qu, quelle montagne sono bellissima, bellissime. I kept memorizing and soon I had like 500 words. And you won't believe what 500 words can do for your ability to communicate. Okay, this gets to the second trial on our video game adventure, which is start talking early. Language isn't math. In math, there are laws. If you break those laws, your equation won't work you literally get the wrong answer. There are wrong answers and right answers in math. If my four-year-old son says two plus two equals 22, I will say, no son, that's wrong. Two plus two equals four. But if my son says, yesterday I eated a apple, I wouldn't say, no son, Yesterday, you ate an apple. Get it right next time. No, I wouldn't say that. The kids said words, I understood them, and it worked. That's language, it isn't math. It's an expressive part of our human experience that is very intuitive and very flexible and messy like human culture and relationships. It is not math. When we approach language like this, we make language feel like math. Like if we don't get the conjugations correct, it'll be like we're saying two plus two equals 22 and you'll be totally wrong and no one will understand you. And all that does is make you nervous and averse to actually speaking in real time. But watch this, I'm about to show you me speaking Italian a month and a half, six weeks after studying it, going from zero words to a few hundred words and trying to speak it speaking with a native in Italy over Skype. And spoiler alert for those Italian speakers, my grammar is horrible. In, in, in questa, quest, questo momento, in questo momento, il lavoro no ha, no ha finito ancora. C'è ancora molto lavoro di fare uh, questa settimana. But guess what? She understood me. I was communicating in a different language with somebody. It's not pretty, it's not linguistically correct, but it's communication. What I'm proposing is that this is the alternative path. This is the goal, not getting the mathematical equations of grammar and syntax correct. As you memorize loads of words, the next most important step is to get yourself speaking as soon as possible. You'll have to do this eventually if you want to speak the language and it's awkward and painful. And so you should start early, right away. On week one of learning the language, you should get on one of these services and start communicating with a native speaker. And now I'm about to say something that actually pains me, which is after two months of this, just memorizing tons of words and having weekly Skype conversations with a native Italian, I was speaking better Italian more fluently than I was French. I eclipsed my French capabilities from a verbal standpoint, not from a grammar standpoint but from a verbal, expressive standpoint after two months compared to four years of work. I'm not saying I was fluent after two months, I'm just saying 
that my experience after two months was stronger than my four years of college French. That's like actually sad for me in some ways because there's so much time of me learning French and it just, ugh, there's a better way. In the course that I mentioned, I go into a deep dive on all the types of activities that I do in one of these sessions with a native speaker that helps make it useful, but I'm not gonna go into that right now. Okay, gate number three. You gotta make this fun. Another major thing missing from this model is fun. Positive association is how it's called in behavioral psychology. The idea that your brain wants to do something if last time they did it, it was sort of fun. Language learning is hard. It requires many months and years. How do you keep it up? You make it interesting and fun. Grammar drills and memorization are not fun. So you have to find ways to make it a positive experience. For me, that is reading an Italian cookbook that has Italian language that I can translate and think about Italian cuisine, which is something I love. I also started listening to Harry Potter in Italian, which I didn't understand a single word at first, but then I got the Kindle version and I sort of followed along uh, digitally and translated some words while I was listening. And now I can like understand probably 80 to 90% of Harry Potter because I love Harry Potter. Don't love JK Rowling though. Love Harry Potter. Okay, so make it fun. The last and final gate in this more direct journey to being able to speak a language is the one that people who have learned other languages have been waiting for me to say, and they're angrily being like, dude, you gotta mention this, and I'm gonna say it, which is yes, eventually, you have to learn the rules. You have to learn grammar. You have to learn pronunciation, and you have to refine it through drills and through a lot of practice. Intentionally, I'm putting this last, because I think you should too. The previous concepts are way more important. Get your first 500 or 1,000 words memorized in your long-term memory. Start speaking every week with a native speaker, make the journey fun, and then start to think about grammar and start to think about all of the rules and the irregulars and the syntax and the direct object pronouns and the past participles. You can do that after maybe two, three months of like being in the trenches. The best part about this is that by that time, you'll be in a place where you can communicate basic ideas so that when you do look at the grammar, it actually fits into the context that you've intuitively developed of expression. It won't just be like in a vacuum of memorizing arbitrary rules, it'll actually apply to something. And that makes it way more interesting to actually memorize. I didn't start really going into grammar until just recently, three months into the process of learning Italian. And it makes a lot more sense. Okay, so that is what I've learned about learning another language, it's like a video game. You don't need to gather all the Korok seeds to beat the game. You don't. Some people think you do. I'm not gonna listen to those people. For me, to beat the game, you just need to be able to talk and be understood. This is my experience, this is my version of it, and again, in the course, I go deeper into exactly how this goes down. The course that me and Nathaniel did is like three and a half hours of like nitty gritty techniques and all of this stuff, but the message is what I've told you here which is that there's a better way to learn languages than the way we learned it in school. I will be studying Italian for years, but the beautiful thing is next time I go to Italy, which who knows when that's gonna be, but at some point I'll go to Italy, I'll show up to a cafe and I'll be able to speak. I'll be able to talk and be understood. And that's what matters to me. So I hope that's what matters to you too. Thanks for watching. Sirve, sir. Sirve. Did we